So I'm Aegon. Good to, good to see you all here. And I actually really wanted to start by commending Mountain View um, for not only having this conversation, but I think the way you're having this dialogue. Um, some of us spend time in other parts of the region, and, and Councilmember Bryant is, is, you know, is at some of the regional agency meetings, and you see at some of those places people in other communities that aren't having this kind of a conversation. The conversation is much more vitriolic and angry, and different sides are being pitted against each other. So I really want to commend you for being able to stand up, talk about what you're going on, what's going on as individuals and as a community. And I think in part, you went through a general plan process that I, my understanding from the outside was very, was very productive. Not everyone agreed with everything that came out of that, but it was a positive experience. And so I think that having these conversations as you go through difficult issues are, are important. However, all the issues that we just heard about today are in fact issues happening all across the Bay Area. And some of them, in fact, are national. In particular, the question about increase in renting and the concern about renters and the issue with wages and the challenges for people to try to get better jobs that pay more money. Those absolutely are incredibly important issues that have to be worked on, but they're also ones that a lot of us are trying to work on at a regional level as well as a national. So what I wanted to do in just a little bit of time today is say a word or two about, about the group I work for, who are we, what's our goal here. Um, talk just a little bit on regional context. Some of this is going to be numbers, but I find it helpful in a big picture. Um, I want to define a sense of what's the housing problem, and I'm kind of putting it up here. It really has to do with incomes. It's not just a question of how much housing is being built, but the question of incomes is really what it comes down to in terms of the housing issue being a problem. We'll find more about why it's happening and look at that some um, around demand and production of housing regionally, um, the process of building housing, particularly um, in San Francisco. Um, we're experts in making it exceptionally difficult to build any housing, and so um, explain a little bit about And then sort of end with some solutions. Solutions we've thought of in San Francisco, that we've thought of um, in San Jose, may or may not be appropriate um, in Mountain View. Um, so quickly, this is the organization I work for. It's, it's 100 years old. There's an urban center in, in downtown San Francisco, which basically means that it's an environment where people can come and have these kinds of dialogues. 150 events a year where people talk about the big issues of the day that are facing um, the city and facing the region. This is what it looks like on the inside. We've, we've had some of these kinds of um, conversations in San Jose with the building that we opened down there. Um, fundamentally, we do policy research, we do advocacy, we put out we put out reports. I recently put out a report about downtown San Jose. Um, we have another one here, that, one that says opting for urbanism. Uh, could be appropriate for, for Mountain View in thinking about urban design. I actually think something Mountain View has done quite well, but the details about how buildings look and how walkable communities are are actually very important in making people embrace and be supportive of change that's happening. They see new buildings that are ugly and make them miserable to walk around. No one's going to want to see any more of those new buildings. Um, clearly is a piece of it. And so we also put on um, events and, and speakers. We're an organization, and I, and I wanted to put this up because being here in Mountain View, we're working as an organization at the scale of the region, but also in the three central cities. Um, we've made a deliberate decision to do our work in the three largest cities of the Bay Area because they're big, they're complex, and in many ways, they have to take on an important leadership role. By them, I mean San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland. And then Mountain View, in a sense, is among a tier of cities, that, you know, the 15 largest cities in the Bay Area that collectively are extremely important, but individually have a very difficult time solving a bunch of problems on their own. So it's really important for the big three cities to work together to try to solve some of these issues and then work in collaboration with the other cities along these transit corridors that we have connected. And the spur is really working with those three places. So a word or two about, about the regional context. Pull it higher? Yes. Oh, there is That's the, the magic. Now everyone can hear me. Yes. Or like, okay. So, on a regional level, what we're trying to understand is how do we accommodate 
a tremendous amount of growth that's, that's projected to come to the region. Now, by projected, it means the Bay Area has had people moving here for decades. Lots and lots of people want to be here. And people, all the people in the room spoke about their children. Children want to stay here. That is what's underlying a lot of the population growth. So over a 30-year period, and these, these kind of projections have been reasonably effective, going from about 7 million people to over 9 million. It's a lot of people. Um, and we can question the growth. We can say it's going to be hard to fit all those people. But the Bay Area as a place has been an environment that a lot of people want to come to. So how do we accommodate all this growth? And this is part of what we're, what we're trying to figure out in a regional way. In a way where the individuals are have a smaller environmental impact. And the technical term is they reduce their, quote, per capita greenhouse gas emissions. It really is a way of saying that they're driving less. It's not that they're necessarily just driving cleaner cars, but that they're driving less. So we're trying to figure that out. What that means is the Bay Area can see all the other regions in California are doing the same thing. But we're trying to get to a point where the average person has 15% has, has less greenhouse gas emission from that. But we're also trying to figure out how we can accommodate housing for workers at all income levels. And that means not just exporting the housing demand to the Central Valley, because that's outside of the Bay Area, but thinking about within the nine counties of the Bay Area where we put all this. And some of the numbers, these are those 15 cities that I was talking about. These are really the 15 cities where it most matters what happens. Um, this happens to be the job numbers, and 38% of the jobs are projected in those three central cities. So those three central cities are key about, on the employment side, making sure that we put jobs in places where this just happens to be figures that are looking at San Francisco at the top, California, and the US. So we've long had housing prices in California that are higher than the national average. But you can see back to the early 1970s, we were right even with the national average. And then things started to verge. And then they got a lot greater during the dot-com boom. They came back down closer on a statewide level, and now they're going further away from the national context. That means it's just much harder for people all over California. And that's particularly driven by the posts. And you can see San Francisco is really an outlier. What's been happening now in the most last couple of months, particularly, is this tremendous pressure for people that are out there buying housing. They're snapping them up right away. And so how to read this chart, this comes from Trulia. But what this is looking at down here on the, the scale to the right is how much housing prices went up last year to this year. So the cities to the right had housing, the price increases went up tremendously. And Oakland's way out there because Oakland prices were somewhat depressed after the housing bust. But they've grown very quickly. But San Jose and San Francisco have grown quickly as well. But the cities at the bottom are ones where houses that were on the market one month are gone the next month. And we're the three outliers. San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland are the outliers. San Diego, Seattle, LA, Denver, places that also are having strong recoveries, homes are staying on longer. So for anybody who's been out there trying to buy a home, it's a tremendous transformation that's happening. And of course, that same thing affects the rental market, because we certainly don't have as, as many rents. So that's, that's a piece of it. But the, the economic context is that on a national level, this is being paired with declining incomes for a lot of people. And what you can see here is that the median renter income on a national level has gone down, whereas the median gross rent has gone up. And turning to the Bay Area context, the issue, and I think some of the speakers that were talking about it, there are not a lot of opportunities to move up from a lower wage job up into the middle. And this is something I've been working on for the past year and a half with groups from all over the Bay Area on a big regional project of how do we rebuild middle wage jobs in the Bay Area. The kind of jobs that build Mountain View, build Silicon Valley, build all sorts of parts of the Bay Area. Right now, we have a tremendous number of jobs at the top and at the bottom and a shrinking middle. And in fact, regionally, over 36% of all jobs pay $18 an hour and less. So that's in the high 30s. And half of those are close to the minimum wage. So a huge percentage of the Bay Area is existing on wages, and those are workers. 
a lot of other people paying rent who are not employed, of course. And so those are people who are struggling in the environment when they're renters. And that's the other big change that's been happening. We are seeing a growth in renting all across the country and also all across the region. And this is in part driven by housing prices, but also some preferences. I think during the housing burst, people saw that buying a home wasn't necessarily a great ticket. Now, in the Bay Area, buying a home and owning a home has been a pretty good investment in the long run. But that kind of psychological change has changed nationally. And you can see there's actually a racial makeup to this, as well as an age one. What this is showing is projected renter household growth over the coming decade. And it's much more likely to be people of color, and also it trends a little bit older as well, in terms of the age of household head. So we're becoming a renter nation in a much more so way, as well as a renter region. Many communities in the South Bay, we know, are lower income. And this is some new data that's just coming out now. I'm sorry, the colors aren't very good. But you can see whole pockets of communities where the, where the, where the household incomes are significantly low. And those, I don't know if that mountain would be sort of right up in there, and there's a mix there. But some of those places, a smaller number of them, and I'm sure there's much more than the data presented here, people are spending over half their income on rent. I think we heard one speaker say it's quite a bit more than that. And I think you're, you're seeing that as rents go up. And this question of rents is actually affecting people across the income spectrum. It's not, it's certainly much more difficult for people at the very bottom. But in terms of, this is a chart showing burden of rent on people's household um, in terms of the, how much they're, they're spending on rent. But it's happening for households that are making over $75,000 a year as well. So this idea of, the, of, of rent being a challenge is really one that's national. So let's just get a little bit into, into answers. Why, why is housing so expensive here? Well, the, the main answer is fundamentally we don't build enough. Um, and we did build a huge amount of housing from 1950 to 1980 in the Bay Area. And if you think about it, if you go around the Bay Area, go around communities, a lot of them were built by 1980. A lot of the housing stock, whether it was built in the 50s or 60s or certainly pre-World War II, but then around 1980, around when Prop 13 passes, we stopped building a lot of housing. And not surprisingly, job growth actually slowed tremendously after 1980. So we've been in a period for 30 years of much slower growth as a region. We might, that might be changing again. And San Francisco in particular, um, <coughs> has been, been very uh, noted, has almost never built more than 2,000 housing units in a year. And this is very different from a city like Seattle. I don't have a lot of comparisons here, but Seattle has had, for a long time, building 3,000, 4,000 housing units a year at times. And that has an impact on rents. Um, and so that question, does supply matter in the housing market? The answer is yes. Um, I don't know if that's been a debate here. That's a debate in San Francisco. People legitimately get up and say, well, I'm not sure there's a relationship. This is a chart that I think sort of proves it. Um, what this is showing is the most expensive housing markets in the United States and how much housing has been built as a share of how much housing was around 30 years ago. So, sure, Detroit and San Francisco are right on top of each other in terms of neither one of them has built a lot, but Detroit hasn't built a lot because it hasn't had a strong economy. The housing markets that are strong are the upper ones, all fundamentally are places that haven't built a lot. And you look out Las Vegas, Raleigh, Atlanta, Phoenix, Sure, a lot of people lost had tremendous housing loss in those environments. They have built a lot. So when you can see, housing production does matter, but it matters at a regional scale. Um, and this is just, a, just an example of what happened in the last year. And I find this actually quite interesting. Um, it's not, not, I'm not trying to pick on Mountain View at all. I'm just trying to get the number here because it doesn't come out. But the third biggest city in terms of housing production last year was Dublin. Anyone would have been to Dublin before? Dublin, Bay Area. <laughs> It's a, and, I, and I remember hearing from the mayor, uh, Tim Zabronti, at one point, he, he said, we're a, a dense suburb, an urban suburb, was sort of his definition. It's an interesting place. It's a, they have some challenges, I think, in terms of a lot of the apartments building, they, apartment buildings they built have a lot of parking. And the streets aren't particularly walkable, and I can pick on them a little bit that way, because 
you're not you're not here to dump it. But that that's that's the urban design piece is important. You want to get those details right so people actually will walk around those environments. But in terms of sheer building housing, they've done a, they've done quite a bit. And San Jose continues um, to be the place, particularly in the South Bay, where a lot. Affordable housing came up a bit, and I think it's important to note that um, those little yellow dots there are our affordable housing project, and there's just not that many of them. Um, it might look like a number here, but we as a, as a nation, again, these are, I'm, I keep referring to national issues because we have challenges at a local level to try to come up with the funding sources for these ideas. We haven't been investing as much in this. Section 8 that was referred to, those are federal programs. So those are decisions that are made far from here about how much to invest in them. What local communities can decide on is where things are located and whether they support them or not. A lot of affordable housing out there, and this is again new data that's being looked at, um, you can't see the boundaries of anything, so it's difficult, but is at risk of being converted to market rate? And there's a number of apartment buildings in this county where that's the issue. And right there is a huge transformation for individuals when that happens, um, when that happens. So the question of jobs housing balance, um, does it matter? It should, what's the right number for Mountain View? And I, I, I'm not going to give you an answer. I don't know what the right number is. But I would encourage you to really think about this on a sub-regional level. And what I mean by that is it really matters what happens between San Francisco and San Jose along the Caltrain corridor through San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. That's where the jobs housing balance really matters. An individual city, it's important to play its role and, and to contribute to that. But primarily, the congestion is sort of obvious point here. The congestion on our freeways is that places where a lot of the housing is being built are not where places When the jobs aren't located right next to transit, people are going to be driving. And so that's, that's the fundamental piece as it relates to, to location. Um, I think we all know that there's a lot of demand to be in the Bay Area. And that's, that's really why housing prices are going up. And, and the key piece of, of what's happening in the Bay Area um, relative to other places is this driving sense of the knowledge industry, and that sort of top red line. That's the piece throughout the last couple of decades that continues to add jobs. And that need for face-to-face -face contact, that desire, as this gentleman here talked about, wanting to be in a community, be able to get to work, that's why the office hasn't gone away. That's why Silicon Valley didn't die. The jobs didn't go to Boise. Um, and, and some of you may remember back in, in the 80s, the, the mayor of Austin would be flying out here and trying to steal companies all the time, and I think the governor of Texas still does that. It didn't happen. It, Silicon Valley didn't die because there's a tremendous need for people to have that face-to-face -face interaction. And as the Bay Area continues to be a place where very high-skilled people want to be, it builds on itself. Now, these questions of housing affordability and transportation and the congestion issues and the fact that we have 27 transit operators that aren't, uh, that aren't well coordinated, those are big long-term challenges we need to work on. But they're ones we've had a long time. And I, I think they're ones that, that continue to threaten the region for a long time, but certainly um, don't necessarily mean that we're going to fall off our economic platform right away. The last piece about housing being so difficult has to do with um, the process. And, and just a, a San Francisco example, we had an election a couple weeks ago, and there was a ballot measure that, that says, if you want to build something on the waterfront, it's going to have to go towards a citywide vote. It's just an example of the kind of thing that happens. And it was actually touted by a number of people as an affordable, as a remedy to some of the affordable housing solutions. Because the housing that would be built, some people contended, would be for high income people. And so we should, we should not allow that to happen. That will suddenly make the, the housing affordability issues better, and we'll put stuff towards a citywide vote. What it's really going to do is make housing more expensive <coughs> to do, because you're going to have to spend money on an election if you want to get something built. Um, and that's, that's San Francisco in this sort of permitting process chart, which none of you can see. Suffice to say, everything goes through a very different process. Um, even a, a building a couple weeks or a couple months ago tried to go forward with, with no parking. Great idea. It had support from a number of people. But there was some opposition from the community. They tried to chop off the top floor. Inadvertently, they lost the affordable housing component of it by that happening. It's these little tweaks, these little cuts that happen at an individual level 
across 100 cities in the Bay Area that really contribute to the housing production. Every time in San Francisco a building goes up that's four stories that could have been five or six, or that's 10 stories when it could have been 12, that has an impact on Mountain View. But the reverse is also true. Every time a building in Mountain View goes up that could have been a little bit taller, it has an impact on other communities. So we're really in something where we're intertwined, um, but we don't quite have the mechanism. And we're a lot of communities, this is a photograph from a county north of San Francisco where there's a lot of consternation about development in the background, but a lot of communities have, have their own sets of reasons to not be supportive of housing. Um, and I just put up some that we hear, and I think this is really a challenge on a, on a regional level. We, we, you know, these are protected from the character, we're concerned about traffic, we're concerned about an impact on city services, concerned about gentrification, we're concerned that we, there's a definition of being urban or suburban, which relates to the, the density of development that happens. These are what we hear this throughout the region. And so what you see is, is, is to build a new unit of housing that's extremely expensive. And this was just some analysis we did in San Francisco um, that said that just the bare cost of building an 800 square foot unit would be 470,000. Now I don't want to leave you discouraged with that, but this is, this is some of the reality of the math of doing things. Now this is a San Francisco number and it had to do with looking at a 100 unit building and it had to do particularly with the land costs um, which, which are higher there. But it also has to do with the process. Um, and some of it you can see 50,000 relates to the permits and city fees issues. And a lot of that happened after Prop 13, right? Cities were trying to find a way to pay for their board or get revenue that they lost when the property taxes were cut in the late 70s, and that's where the fees came from. And so those issues, and, and Prop 15 is a very complicated one to homeowners and, and um, but that's, those are the issues that we as a state are dealing with. So those are some of the kind of why. Why, are we, why do we have this housing problem throughout the Bay Area that, that I wanted to, wanted to kind of put out there? It's very complicated, and it is not very easy to solve. But it doesn't mean you don't try to solve it. Let me do a caveat about shelves, because I know part of this is really about, is about the shelves. Um, and on my way here, I, I passed about I think 12 shelves in my neighborhood, about um, 75 shelves, I think, as I was, I unfortunately couldn't, couldn't take Caltrain coming down. But shelves really are part of, of, of the ecosystem of the Bay Area um, when they really come about. Um, but I, what I want to kind of encourage and thinking about is I, I want to argue that the shuttles are really more about land use and not about transportation. And they're really not that much about gentrification, um, although a lot of people talk about that. This is hard to see. Imagine what's missing on the chart here is the coastline. But the top piece there is San Francisco with those big red dots. The red dots are office buildings near Caltrain and BART. And the blue dots are office buildings that are more than a half mile from Caltrain or BART. Mm -hmm. And so what you have in Silicon Valley, the peninsula in the South Bay, is a tremendous amount of office space that's not right on top of the Caltrain system. And there's not a lot of direct bus lines for people coming from up around the Bay Area to get to those places. So the shuttle becomes a very convenient way to directly bring people to those places. It's as simple as that. Now there's a lot that has to do with it, recruiting great employees and having to, to compete with other people. But, it's, it, but fundamentally, there's a land use question here. And so the challenge back to the cities, I would say, is are you supportive of job development next to your Caltrain stations? Because in part, the traffic issues, the congestion we see, is people driving because the jobs aren't next to transit. And this is true for every city. And I know Mountain View has had some buildings that aren't fully occupied in the downtown core, so you're subject to the whims of the market. So that becomes difficult. But fundamentally, um, that, that's really what we see. And you know, you look at kind of individual companies, it's not, there's a picking on any of them, but the, the location of a lot of the companies, the larger ones, aren't directly on top of that Caltrain system. Um, and that's really what, it, what there's very different about if you think about a downtown Oakland, a downtown San Jose that doesn't have a lot of jobs, um, downtown San Francisco, where the majority of people are arriving on transit in San Francisco, not in San Jose. 
because of that, that connection between jobs and transit right there. But I did want to also point that opposition to shuttles in San Francisco isn't always about gentrification. And this happened to be popped up on Facebook today from my neighborhood association in San Francisco, um, which is opposition to an attempt in San Francisco to take the Muni bus stops and share them with employee shops. And because they want to make it so that they're not going to compete and conflict with each other to take away a couple of parking spaces just beyond the bus stop, because there's no parking lot where the bus stop is. And so the neighborhood association is opposed to that. Um, so there's nothing to do with gentrification. So this neighborhood, some of you may know as the kind of famous painted ladies, got rid of tour buses too. So people have a lot of reasons to, um, and they had the tour buses now have to park a couple of blocks away and, and the tourists walk over. I had a very simple idea. Get rid of every other mini bus stop and turn it over to the shuttles and the tour buses. It'll make Muni go faster and you won't have any of these conflicts. And so a lot of times what we have in these contexts is people get caught up in a sense that you have to fight over these issues um, and you can't quite, quite get a solution. So, speaking of solutions, I want to get to that in just a moment. I want to just end this talking a tiny bit about jobs. And jobs are key. We're talking a lot about housing, but jobs are so important because people often forget in housing conversations that jobs near transit are really the thing that gets people to ride transit. Um, and that's true across job centers in the entire region. The Google campus gets to such low driving rates because they've provided such a profoundly excellent transportation system. Um, if it were directly on top of Caltrain, and, the, and Caltrain became electrified and had this incredible 15 minute service that I think, hopefully, is in, is in the future, you could, get, you could get to the same kind of percentages. Um, but that's really the difference. This is, it really comes down to what kind of easy to drive versus ones that are in a, in a transit core. And that's why the question of jobs and where they locate um, is important. And so even downtown San Francisco, these conflicts between jobs and housing are important. And a lot of the buildings that have been proposed around Trans Bay, near where Caltrain might eventually go to, have been housing. And I would argue that's probably a mistake. That's so valuable for the region to have those jobs near transit. That's a more appropriate place for jobs. So let me end quickly with solutions, because I know we're, we're, we're short on time. Some other things. Mountain View cannot, on its own, solve the affordable housing challenges of the region. But it doesn't mean that you should sort of ignore it. One thought you've done, you've done your general plan work, but this idea of careful neighborhood planning, really getting agreement among community members, but allowing community members to think big and push boundaries is important. And it takes time to do. And San Francisco has done, has done a number of this. Um, that's on the, the housing front, this is on the job front, but that's when people in San Francisco now see these cranes and say, how did that happen? Why, why is that housing going up? That was planning, it was neighborhood planning. It was decisions about where to grow and where to build and what the density was. And I think they were, they, it was wise. And the design, the urban design of those new buildings is so much better than buildings of 10 and 15 and 20 years ago. And if you, if you go to San Francisco, you can go on Market Street, you can notice that. And I think there's a lot to learn from it. This is an affordable housing project that was built by David Baker with no parking. And that's possible to do. Not everyone. So clearly, this idea of doing neighborhood planning, upzoning in the right places is important, particularly around transit. So there's a lot of places you think about what's, what are the heights allowed around some of your transit stations? Do they allow for a sufficient amount of development? And I think we know the history with BART. BART came in, and a lot of places didn't have any development. I mean, here I'm picking on uh, North Berkeley, uh, just, just as a place where, where literally there's almost been nothing built since the train system was, came in and was put underground. Um, and, but, but thinking beyond the station area is extremely important here in the South Bay. Um, downtown San Jose is a place, and Deerdon is an extremely important um, place for, for job growth, but really the neighboring system, the neighboring cities are where, where Mountain View is a part of, are really have to start working together. And so what, it, what does it mean to work at a sub-regional level to, to promote housing? You could, among several cities, think about what's the overall growth for your corridor. 
And this is typically done somewhat at the county level. San Mateo did this a little bit at the county level, but I think it would be appropriate to try to think about a corridor, um, you know, larger than just sort of Mountain View, Sunnyville here, but really a, a, among a number of cities and try to see if, if, if there's a number that's 20,000, let's say, across a number of cities. Could that number be shared? What if one city ends up choosing to grow more than another? Is there a way to have some financial arrangements between them? This has been looked at and people aren't exactly sure how to make it work, but it's worth considering. It's worth considering because ultimately it's about the corridor. But every community has to be a part of it. Um, increasing the production of affordable housing is, is fundamental to this. Um, there's some math involved, clearly, because each affordable housing unit to build from scratch is going to be about $250,000. Um, there are sources of revenue, not as much as there used to be. Um, San Francisco has tried and, and probably will again, general obligation bonds, um, taking general fund support. We actually have a housing trust fund in San Francisco that Spur worked on that takes some of the old redevelopment set aside through the property tax. Um, buy down market rate units is, a, is another way of doing things, but, but surplus land, underutilized hotels, making use of these is important. Um, process reforms like making housing as a right, so it doesn't have to go through the onerous process of, of getting approval. Once you've done the plan and someone comes in with a project that needs the plan, they can go forward. Uh, the question of the corporate campus clearly is one I think you, you thought about, but it, it still is, is alive. This is the new Samsung campus. Um, this relates not just to the question of housing, but also to how buildings meet the street, whether they're located on transit. Um, the N1 campus on North First Street, I think, is another um, good example of, of a building that's trying to be built as an office building right adjacent to transit. Um, some of you may have seen this just sort of kind of out, way out their idea of, of what would it take actually to produce um, housing that's directly related to, to, to workers. It's a, I think it's an important think piece that just gets back to, to kind of shared numbers. Um, but the idea of making the environment more walkable and more attractive is important. And I said this before, as new housing comes in, we don't want it to be something that people then reject because they don't like it. They don't like the architecture, they don't like the tile rooms that you see too many places, they don't like the blank walls. And those are things that they can be changed. Um, student housing is also kind of a, a, a key piece um, as well. The question of renters though is extremely important, and I know there's not a photograph behind here, but renters are, and, and coming up with solutions to renting is, is very important. And it's extremely difficult in California given some state laws. And there's people working at changes to state legislation, um, but, but some ideas relating to longer notification periods, legal help during eviction process, these are things cities can do. There can be relocation benefits. Those are decisions that can be made at the local level. Um, and the kind of rent control that we saw in the late 70s when Prop 13 passed is not possible on, on new development, but some of these other ideas are good. And, and then lastly, in terms of ideas, the, the sort of question of secondary units. This is really one that is, that is actually relatively simple to do, and, and estimates in San Francisco alone are you could add one-third new housing stock by allowing kind of cottages and in-laws and different things. Now, these are in existing single-family neighborhoods. So it's certainly a change to zoning um, that people consider, but it is a way to produce a lot of very low-cost housing, because the land is already there. The land is free. So I know we're going to wrap in just a moment. I just wanted to kind of throw out a few hard questions to sort of end with. Um, it's just sort of across the board. This one is maybe not as relevant for, for Mountain View, but should we be discouraging Kedetaris? I mean, I don't know how many people in Google have a Kedetaris in, in downtown Mountain View that are working in other places, but this you certainly are seeing in, in San Francisco and big cities. Does Airbnb help or hurt? I would argue Airbnb actually could be a solution for people as a revenue generator, but is, is that something that's, that's having an impact on the housing supply? Is this clash between protecting community character and affordability inevitable? That we want our communities, we like how they are, and everyone that spoke in the beginning said, I like Mountain View, I like how it is. 
does it like it how it is, you mean you don't want anything to change, you don't want the physical environment to change, and does that clash with affordability? It's a tough question. The Bay Area is a place that a lot of people like it the way it is. Um, and it's a place that I hope I've argued somewhat, there's things that we can do to deal with the affordability. Most acutely, each place recognizing regional responsibility, growing in a certain way. But there's parts of California that have, have really been absent a lot of the investment that's come to our regions. And investments like high-speed rail and other kind of major transportation investments have some connection to other parts of, of, of California. I doubt people are going to be commuting from Modesto to San Jose. But there's a, there is a debate that we get into in thinking about the Central Valley. And if not people commuting, what we're seeing, we've already seen this, tremendous number of jobs that used to be in the Bay Area have shifted. The whole warehousing industry, a lot of it that had been in Hayward, has now shifted over to Tracy and into those areas. So, a few ideas um, that I just wanted to put out there. I know went on longer, longer than I expected, my apologies. But I think that recognize that the housing issues of the Bay Area are what one might call a chronic problem. They are not just today. They are not just the last couple of years. They are not the fault of the tech industry. They are something that we've really been in, I would argue, since 1980 and probably a little bit before in the 70s. Many years in the making. It's going to take more years to, to, to solve it. But what we do now and decisions that are made will affect things over the coming decades. So when we think about children, and I have children, that I want them to stay in the region, that is really where we can have a big impact as things go forward. So thank you for your patience and look forward to our conversation.